Well, good evening, Team Grace. Thank you for tuning in for our Bible study this evening. We are continuing our amazing walk through the book of Genesis. As a reminder, the book of Genesis is the first of 14 narrative books. The narrative books are the base storyline of salvation history. If you read these 14 books of the sacred scriptures, you know the entire story of salvation history. There are 73 books in all the scripture, but you only have to read these 14 if you really want to know the basic storyline, the interaction between God and humanity, the preparation, and then the coming for the Messiah. Genesis is the first of these 14 books. You recall that the book of Genesis is divided into two parts. First, there is what's called the early world or prehistory, Genesis chapters 1 through 11. We have knocked that out, Team Grace. We have completed and concluded that part of salvation history. The second part of Genesis, Genesis 12 to 50, is known as the time of the patriarchs. That's the era in which we are in now. Of course, we are still walking through the life of the first patriarch, Abraham. The rest of Genesis will be the story of his family, his son, his grandsons, his great-grandsons. So very exciting in terms of this period of salvation history, Genesis 12 to 50. That's where we are now. So first book of the Bible, first narrative book, the second part of the book of Genesis, the era of the patriarchs. That's where we are. This evening what we're going to do is we're going to conclude chapter 18. So we're going to pick up where we left off, which is on verse 16. We're going to walk through verses 16 to verse 33. That's the end of chapter 18. Okay. I want to provide a context, but before I get too ahead of myself, because it's exciting stuff, Team Grace, let's go ahead and say a prayer and ask for God's blessing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, you come to each of us and you call us by name. You call us to trust you, to follow you, to go wherever you lead us. You are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end of all things. You are the Ancient of Days, the Awesome, the Mighty Counselor, and the Gift of Peace. You are the maker of oaths and covenants and the fulfillment of every heart. We ask that you come and send your Holy Spirit upon us. Help us to receive your divine instruction, to allow your grace to mold and shape our lives according to your teachings. Help us always, in all that we do, follow your path, your way of righteousness. And we ask these and all good things through Christ our Lord, Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, Team Grace, so we're going to go again to Genesis chapter 18. If you're not there, I encourage you, please uh, join me there, chapter 18. A reminder again, Genesis is the first book of the Bible. The chapters are the large numbers, oftentimes bold, and the verses are the smaller numbers within the chapter. So we're going to go to Genesis chapter 18, verse 16. As we're there, I want to just give us a reminder, again, set the stage, help us understand the context. Earlier in chapter 18, recall what happened. God visited Abraham. The manifestation of the divine presence through three angelic beings. Abraham recognizes God and hails him by the familiar Yahweh. He asks God not to pass by, but to stay with him. Abraham encounters God. God has made a house call on his servant Abraham. Abraham is so overwhelmed by the angelic presence representing God's presence that he goes and he quickly provides them with outrageous, beautiful, over-the-top hospitality. An abundance of food he provides to his guests. And then he is asked, where is Sarah, your wife? He's like, uh, she's in the tent. <laughs> And again, the promise is made, ratified, reinforced, that within a year, Sarah will be with child. Sarah will give birth to a child. Even though she's of older age, even though she has passed menopause, she will bear a child. As Abram is speaking, Abraham is speaking with the angelic presence, Sarah is actually eavesdropping in the tent. And she hears what the angels say, and she begins to laugh. <laughs> 
Abraham had laughed, laughed previously. Now it's Sarah's turn. She laughs. And of course, the son of this promise, the firstborn of Abraham, will be named Isaac, which is Hebrew for laughter. So this is the context, the divine visitation, the providing of hospitality, the inquiry about Sarah and the reinforcement of the promise. This is the beginning of chapter 18, verses 1 to 15. We now pick up verse 16. And let's look at the divine narrative. We're going to read that together. Again, this is chapter 18, verse 16. The sacred narrative reads, Then the men set out from there, and they looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I, am, what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him. No, for I have chosen him, that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry which has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom, but Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed destroy the righteousness with the wicked? The righteous with the wicked. Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be from you, far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abram answered, Behold, I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. I am who, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again he spoke to him and said, Suppose 40 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it. If I find 30 there, he said, Behold, I have taken upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Okay, so, <laughs> Team Grace, we have a lot there. Uh, obviously, Father Abraham is uh, definitely pushing some things, right? So let's try to understand this. First, it's important for us to understand that Abraham at this point as he is literally walking with the presence of God, reflected through the angels, he's walking with them, he's still providing hospitality. And listen to the beginning of what God is saying, because it gives a context to the whole exchange between Abraham and God. Because it can sound as if God's changing his mind. It can sound as if Abraham is somehow more righteous than God. It could sound as if Abraham has somehow finagled a deal with God. Are any of that the case? Of course not. God is infinitely perfect and blessed in himself. 
So then what's happening here? Let's go back to the beginning. Listen to what God is saying. Again, it provides a context. Verse 17. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him. No, for I have chosen him, that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So again here, God is speaking within himself and saying, do I, do I keep this away from Abraham? No, no, I'm going to tell him. Why? Because Abraham has to teach his family and his family has to teach their family. And, and this is the way of the Lord. This is how the way of God is going to be passed on. And the way of God is marked by righteousness and justice. So the entire context here of this last part of chapter 18 of Genesis is God trying to teach Abraham the way of righteousness and justice so that he can teach his children so that then God's chosen people will be the ones who are marked by their righteousness and their justice. And sometimes God, when he's teaching, he gets right into the trenches. He rolls up his sleeves. Things can get dirty. There's mud and blood and everything flying all over the place. And God's right in there kind of getting it to make sure that we get it. And here right now, he is meeting Abraham exactly where he is. And he is having this exchange with Abraham. And it looks like Abraham's kind of pushing and pushing and pushing with God. The whole time Abraham's actually fulfilling exactly what God wants him to do. Because Abraham must learn the path of righteousness and justice. He must know the way of the Lord so he can then pass it on. So that God's chosen people will be a people of righteousness and justice. And they will not live the way of, the life, uh, the way of life of the unbeliever. Nor will they fall into the practice of the unbeliever of exercising a lack of justice or being unjust to anyone. Okay, I want to pick this up, but first let's dive through some specific verses throughout this part of the narrative. And then what I'd like to do is come back to this and highlight a few things and particularly develop that point of God teaching Abraham. And specifically teaching him righteousness and justice. But let, let's walk through, through the verses. So if we go to verse 19, so chapter 18, verse 19, way of the Lord. This is a very important expression. It's the first time we see this. A first time that we see a full encapsulation of a particular way of life. That if you're going to be a member of God's chosen people, if you are now a member of the circumcised, you must now, you are part of the covenant, you must now follow this way. Now this way of the Lord, at this point in salvation history, was what we call the natural law. Not natural law like nature, like plants and trees and birds. Not that nature. Nature like our essence, our human essence, our human nature, who we are as human beings. And so this law of our essence, this law of our human nature, the natural law, it's written in our hearts. This is what every human being knows. It's not good to kill your neighbor. It's not good to sleep with your mother. It's not good to steal. We know certain things that are just written in our hearts. No one has taught them to us. These aren't human conventions. These aren't moral codes that have been imposed upon us. We haven't been conditioned by our society or culture. These are just things that are literally written on our hearts. And we know what is right and what is wrong. And the closer we get to God, the more clarity we have on what is right and what is wrong. So here, in reference to the way of the Lord, it's speaking about following the movements of the heart properly formed by God's covenant in order to follow this path of righteousness and justice. Later in salvation history, as a help, God will give to us the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, which theology has described as the privileged expression of the natural law. And the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, the moral law of God was given to us because Sometimes in our fallenness, when we're away from God, we get confused. Like sometimes we don't know what our heart says. 
In fact, sometimes in fallenness, our heart can lie to us. Do this, it'll be okay. Do that, you'll feel really good. Do that, yeah, it's all right. Our heart lies to us, it's fallen. So the very heart that we're supposed to be listening to, that's supposed to be following the moral law of God, can betray us. So God has given us his law. This is why the psalmist says that God's law is a lamp unto our feet. It guides us, it gives us direction, it provides clarity. Because our heart, as the prophet Jeremiah tells us, is a treacherous thing. So here at this point, in the time of the patriarchs, they do not have the moral law, the Decalogue at this point. They have the natural law, which is a moral law written on the heart, but not given by revelation, as we see later in salvation history. So truth be told, it could be a little more difficult at this point to understand what is the fallenness of my heart and, and what is the movement to moral truth, to moral goodness. This in large part is why God is teaching Abraham. He's instructing him and teaching him. He's forming his heart, preparing his heart, fortifying his heart. We could say cleaning his heart out of all the sinfulness and darkness and fallenness so that his heart will be pure and good. And then he will know the path of righteousness and the path of justice. I know in our world today, we define justice solely in terms of punitive action. Because of that, we oftentimes approach justice with great hesitation. But make no mistake about it, Team Grace, justice is a Christian virtue. Justice is a virtue of the children of God. Justice is a very important virtue. Because it is punitive, if someone causes harm, they should receive discipline. Why? So that they might change their life, so they might not repeat what is evil or harmful. But justice also has a positive expression. If I work for someone, I receive a just wage. If I loan someone to something, something to someone, they should return it in as good or better condition. Justice is a powerful virtue, both in terms of our interaction with our neighbors. Justice is also a powerful virtue in terms of our relationship with God. God demands justice. God has a due that we owe him. In our theological tradition, we call that the virtue of religion. The virtue of religion is precisely the fulfillment of justice towards God. I hope, Team Grace, you can see how important that virtue of justice is for the children of God and for people of goodwill. And it's precisely here why God is teaching not simply the path of righteousness, but specifically the path of justice, to fortify, to teach the heart of Father Abraham so that he could then teach his children and that the chosen people, God's own people, will be a people of righteousness and justice. So again there in verse 19, the way of the Lord. This is the way of the Lord. This is the way of righteousness. This is the way of justice. Incidentally, later in Genesis Chapter 25, excuse me, chapter 26, verse 5, we will again see this expression, the way of the Lord, and this reference to this natural law in our heart. Again, that's Genesis chapter 26, verse 5. Later in the New Testament, St. Paul, who of course was trained as a rabbi in the Old Covenant, who would have known the sacred scriptures very well of the Old Testament, he describes in the, in the letters to the Romans the importance of having this natural law, the moral law that's written on our heart. That's Romans chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. So Paul is referencing exactly this way of the Lord, this natural law in our heart. Of course, in the new cut, we are assisted by grace. We are assisted by even further revelation by the teachings of Jesus Christ. But Paul even references this right or wrong that we have just because we are human beings, because we have a human essence, a human nature. All right, let's look at verse 21, chapter 19, verse 21. I will go down to see. God has heard some outcries. There have been obviously some people praying and complaining about Sodom and the cities of the plain. And God is going to come and check it out. Right? Remember, he's teaching, Sod he's teaching Abraham Justice, he's going to Sodom, he's going to check it out. Now, it's interesting that God is described in these human-like terms so that we can understand him and what he's doing, understand his ways. And, and here we see the living God is almost like a, an inspector, right? He, he receives all these prayers and these complaints and he's like, 
I'm going to go check it out, right? You can imagine he's coming. It's like he's going to check out the city of Sodom and, and the cities of the plains to make sure because he is a God of justice. Are these complaints, is this outcry true? And if it's true, then he will administer justice, right? punitive justice. If it is not true, then nothing will harm the cities. Now, on a quick aside, Team Grace, that should fill us with great confidence. Our God is a God of justice. Whether someone speaks ill of us to him in prayer or to our neighbors, God knows who we are. God is a God of justice. God knows who we are. He knows what we've said, what we've thought, what we've done. And he is always on the side of truth. He is always on the side of justice. As we receive this consolation, knowing that about God, we should also feel a challenge that we ourselves should be a people of justice. One of the most practical applications of justice we can give to our neighbor is to ask for their version, their side, when we hear something about them. As we are told by the Holy Ones, be sure to hear both sides before you pass a judgment. And we are called to judge actions, but not people. But even in our judgment of actions, we have to be careful. We have to exercise justice to make sure, wait a minute, I heard this from someone else. Let me ask and find out. Here we are told in verse 21, God himself is going down in order to check out what's happening, what's happening in Sodom. Let's go to chapter 18, verses 22 to 23. Here Abraham begins to intercede for Sodom. God says, I've heard a lot of things. I'm looking now. It's looking pretty bad. Pretty bad. Um, and he's going to call down judgment. And Abram begins to intercede for Sodom. He's bargaining with the Lord. And the Lord allows it. Even as he's bargaining, don't lose the fact that Abram is, Abraham is showing great deference to God as he is literally bargaining. This dialogue between Abraham and God focuses on the character, the nature of God. Is he some petty, vengeful Canaanite deity like all the other false gods in the area? Is he some overly benevolent and licentious God? Hey, do whatever you want, party it up. This centers around the knowledge of the very character and the nature of God. Recall, Team Grace, we are still in the early parts of salvation history. Humanity, we are still trying to understand the true God, the living and true God. We are trying to understand who is this God. And here God is literally teaching Abraham who he is. Because this will focus not simply on his character, not simply on the nature of God. In this exchange with Abraham, God is revealing to Abraham his justice and his mercy. And I think it's very powerful that we place ourselves back in that context of Genesis chapter 18 and realize that here again, this is new, this is fresh. We are just beginning to understand who the true and living God is. Oftentimes in the New Covenant, because we have received such a beautiful and powerful patrimony of revelation of God, we can take for granted, we can think here in the New Covenant, we have received all revelation in Christ, that somehow Abraham had that. Abraham did not have that. Abraham surrounded by Canaanite deities, false deities, that are being worshipped, deities who were vengeful and petty and who were hurtful or licentious. The wine god who's like, hey, party it up, you know? Or the death god is like, kill them all, right? This is the culture of Abraham. Again, in the midst of this, he knows the true God. He has left Ur. He bumped into Melchizedek, who is this oddly placed God, priest of the true God, the most high God. And now he's trying to understand, who is this God? Who is the true God? And God is teaching him. He's teaching him again about his character, about his nature. He is specifically teaching him about his justice and his mercy. Later, incidentally, in chapter 19, which we will get to, we will see both of these played out, his justice and his mercy. We will see divine justice fall upon Sodom in chapter 19, verse 24. 
Just, however, as we will also see divine mercy being given to Lot and to the city to which he flees in Genesis chapter 19, verse 16. So we will see in the next chapter as we walk through it, both the exercise of God's justice and mercy and the fact that the living and true God makes a distinction between them. The fact that he seeks to exercise true justice. He's coming to check it out. He wants to make sure before he makes a judgment. And he is also a God of mercy. That if it proves untrue, if there is someone truly seeking him, then he will show mercy. He will give pardon. He will preserve the righteous or those who are pursuing righteousness from punishment. And again, in this way, God is teaching Abraham, his, his servant, this great patriarch. And it's because of these lessons that Abraham received from God that we can even know now that God is merciful, that God is just. We take for granted, as we would say in secular history, we stand on the shoulders of giants. It's because of the patriarch, because of his exchange with the living God in this context, for example, in chapter 18 of Genesis, that we can later know here in our lives now, know that God is merciful and just. We stand on the shoulders of powerful patriarchs. We stand on the shoulders of giants, men who encountered the living and true God and were taught by him. And we receive that patrimony of revelation so that we might know him, we, his children, as we hail him, Father Abraham, even in the mass, Abraham, our father in faith. We acknowledge as we call him father that we are his sons and daughters because we have received his instruction. We have in, received the way of the Lord, the way of righteousness and the way of justice. And so again, we see in chapter 18, verses 22 to 23 this bargaining between Abraham and God this instruction this hands-on instruction between the living God and the patriarch with our father Abraham okay so there's a few highlights of some verses some some context or expressions I wanted to particularly highlight but I, I want to now go back to that broader subject in terms of what is happening, like is, is, is Abraham just provoking God? Is, is Abraham being, you know, rebellious? Uh, is, is Abraham's sense of justice above that of God? Uh, as we talk about God teaching Abraham, like what, what does that look like? Uh, obviously we see this back and forth. Is, is that how he's teaching him? Uh, how are we supposed to understand this? And, and to help us with this, we have to go to Jewish... Uh, interpretation of the scriptures. Uh, we saw, call it uh, uh, Jewish exegesis, right? And, and we have a rich Christian collection, a, a rich Christian interpretation of this passage. But sometimes to give a, perhaps a, a different perspective or uh, for us perhaps a, a fresh perspective because maybe many of us haven't heard uh, how did the Jewish people interpret this text? How do they interpret it now? So Drawing from some of that exegesis from the Jewish faith, uh, exegesis just means biblical interpretation. So the exegesis, biblical interpretation. How did the Jewish people understand this part of the book of Genesis? And what's very interesting, you might recall from last week, is that in Jewish theology, they see three movements within the chapter, within uh, chapter 18. So they see first, God encounters Abraham. So, so Abraham has this uh, encounter with God. Right? Yahweh is about to walk by. Abraham recognizes him. It's been perhaps some 13 years of silence because of his disobedience with Ishmael. And, and he sees God and, and, and he recognizes God. He runs after him. Right. So Abraham and Yahweh, the true God, have this encounter. Right? That's first. And then secondly... From that encounter, Abraham is moved to tremendous hospitality. Right? And that is particularly emphasized in the Jewish tradition, this act of hospitality. Later in chapter 19, we're going to see Lot, Abraham's nephew, appeal to this rule of hospitality. We're going to see how that plays out in an interesting way in chapter 19. But here, Abraham encounters God. He has his move to hospitality. He cares for those under his responsibility, right? So those who have been sent to him, he has care for them. And he provides wonderful care. Well, 
the first movement, the second movement, and then in Jewish theology, the third movement is then Abraham is led to intercede for others. And this three-part movement, Abraham encounters God, Abraham provides, provides hospitality, Abraham intercedes for others, in Jewish theology are seen as, as one act in three movements. And it's God encountering his servant and then shaping his heart for hospitality and for intercession. And these will be a part of that way of the Lord, that path of righteousness, the path of justice. So Jewish theology sees this as kind of uh, Abraham's uh, university instruction, right? God is coming in chapter 18 and he's teaching hands-on Father Abraham about who he is, about who God is, right? And so in Jewish theology, the three are connected. Now, in our Bible study, I separated the first part of chapter 18 from the second part. So last week from this week. Because in Christian theology, that first part of chapter 18, verses 1 to 15, as you saw last week, there was a lot there that we had to unpack. If I were being consistent in the Jewish tradition, I would never have separated last week from this week. Again, in Jewish theology, the three movements of chapter 18 are seen as a unified whole. Because again, the emphasis is that God is teaching Abraham about who God is, about who he himself is. And so the three are seen as one. Okay. And we would say this is a movement of, of instruction, of teaching. Uh, Jewish theology would also emphasize it's teaching the path of righteousness, the way of the Lord, okay? as, as the narrative, the divine narrative uh, says itself. Okay. Now, <laughs> I love this. The second part of chapter 18 in the Jewish tradition is known as the great argument. Right? Isn't, that just, isn't that just a, a really good way of describing that? Right? God and Abraham are having it out, right? They're having a moment, right? The great argument. Right? So in Jewish theology, if you were to reference, if you were to speak to a rabbi or a Jewish theologian and simply say the great argument, they would know, oh, the last part of chapter 18 of the book of Genesis, right? The great argument. Right. Again, I just very much appreciate that. As you can, it's just kind of odd or weird to think of like a human being right, having an argument with God, right? And God's actually like, you know, nurturing it, like fueling it, like, oh yeah, yeah, really? What? Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, well, sure, yeah, sure, sure, forty-five, sure, yeah, thirty, sure, 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 for twenty, sure, sure, and just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right? It, it's it's it, this this great argument, right? as is described uh, in the Jewish tradition. Okay. But as much as we can call it, and even as we might want to comically envision it, the great argument is actually very significant. It is a turning point in salvation history. It is a turning point in the history of humanity's interaction with God. More broadly, we can say it is the turning point in the history of the human spirit. Because this is the first time in salvation history where we will see a human being argue with God. Like the all-powerful, ever-living judge of the earth argue with God. And what's particularly unique in this encounter between Abraham and God, this, this great argument is that we find no other such argument in any of the other literature of the ancient world of this time period. In the other ancient cultures with the false gods, humanity were afraid, the gods were petty, they were capricious. Now, this could be in part because of the fallen human mind, they invented these deities, it could also be that these were bad spirits, these were demons who were pretending to be gods. So there may have actually been a preternatural activity being done by fallen spirits, by, by demons, right? But whatever the case, whether it's the fallenness of the human mind or bad spirits or both, the, the deities, supposed deities, were something to be afraid of, something to, to make sure that you, you know, uh, show deference to, make sure that you appease them, right? Scott, you, you, you didn't provoke them. You didn't argue with them. 
And yet, in all of the religious literature of the ancient cultures at that time, we find nothing even comparable to Abraham's great argument with God in chapter 18 of the book of Genesis. Abraham is definitely feeling some type of move, some type of place where he can feel that he can argue with the all-powerful, ever-living, the one true God. And again, this is a turning point, turning point in our relation with God, turning point with our, our understanding of the human spirit, turning point in terms of the revelation of God and completely unprecedented by any of the other cultures at that time. So something is definitely happening in Abraham and his interaction with this true God, the one true God, the uh, most powerful, most high God, right? Now that's very important, Team Grace, that we understand this. Again, later, because we are later in salvation history, because we sit within the new covenant, we can take this for granted, right? Because we know the face of our Father, because we know that he is Father, because we have a filial relationship with him in Jesus Christ, we can take this for granted. I can pray tonight and argue with God about whatever. Right? Hey, why don't you help, really help this family? Why are you making them suffer so much? Or hey, you know, why don't you do this? Or, I can be arguing with God. But in the ancient world at this time of Abraham, no one else would have ever dared to do that because they would have thought the deities, these false gods, they're going to hurt me. They're going to make me punish me. They're going to make sure they come in there so petty. And then out of that whole backdrop, here comes Abraham. Remember, Team Grace, earlier in our study, I, I focused on how Jewish theology, how salvation history views Abraham, that he was as if it was a new creation, a new form of man that was brought forth from the darkness in this Abraham. And here we see this being exercised. Abraham is arguing with God. He's not afraid. He doesn't think that he is somehow going to be hurt or harmed by this. He's showing deference to God, but he's definitely arguing with him. And again, we can take that for granted now as we know that God wants us to talk and speak to him. He wants us to tell us what's on our heart. He wants us to be honest and true. The Lord Jesus will tell us God does not lead lip service. But Abraham didn't know that. But there was something in the relationship he had with the Most High God, with the one true God, that gave him this boldness. What later we would call what the Catechism of the Catholic Church calls filial boldness. It's the boldness of a son. Sons will say things to their father that no one else will say. In the context, the cultural context in which there are servants or slaves, a son will say something that a servant or a slave would never think about saying to the leader of the house. And we see that filial boldness in Abraham as he has this great argument with God. Now it's important that we understand what is this argument about? God has come in order to check on Sodom and he sees the validity of the outcries. We know that Sodom is a pretty despicable place. In fact, we've already heard that referenced in Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, we hear about how terrible the Sodomites were, right? And then later now in chapter 19, we're going to hear again about the Sodomites. And here we're going to hear in chapter 19 the reference, let me give you this reference. We see it in chapter 13 and then in chapter 19 it's again going to be referenced uh, in terms of how terrible the people of Sodom are. So chapter 13, verse 13 and then in 19, chapter 19, I'll give you that citation as we move through the lesson. We're going to see it again. So God has already heard about this. He referenced himself that there were outcries. He's come in order to make sure that justice is exercised. He's going to see. Here he sees the evilness, the wickedness of Sodom, and he decides that he's going to inflict judgment upon it. So that's chapter 18, verses 23 to 25. Let, let's read that again together. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed destroy the righteous with the wicked? 
Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? So God has seen the wickedness of Sodom. He's going to call down judgment upon the city and Abraham speaks up. And Abraham challenges God again, this great argument, and he says, but God, what if there's 50 righteous? Would you really destroy the entire city and kill the 50 righteous? Would you spare the city if there are 50 righteous people? And God says, yeah, I'll spare for that. He says, what about if there's a five-person difference? Right? What about if there's 45? Right? God says, okay, I'll spare for 45. Right? I almost feel like you're playing some type of like gambling game or something here, right? And Abraham says, what about, you know, 30. God says, okay, I'll spare it for 30. And, and you've heard the narrative. It goes like this until they get to 10. And God says, I will spare Sodom and the cities of the plain if there are 10 righteous people. And we see this back and forth. I want to emphasize that there's nothing like this up until this point in salvation history and we see nothing like this in the ancient literature of that day. The Jewish tradition, retrieving again this perspective, the Jewish tradition will tell us that this is the birth of the argument for heaven. Remember, Jewish theology does not have a developed understanding, a developed theology of heaven. Here, Jewish theology will say, this is the beginning of the argument for heaven. Because obviously, God has come, he is with his servant Abraham, there's this debate and there's something in Abraham's boldness that would imply a relationship that would not conclude in this life. That somehow Abraham is being prepared for something. Not simply to know the way of the Lord, not simply to pass it on to his children and to the chosen people, but something beyond that. It seems to imply something else, this relationship, this intimacy that Abraham has with God. And Jewish theology would say this is the birth of the argument for heaven it is the beginning of the covenantal dialogue between God and his children. Remember covenant? That's where two become one. God has made a covenant with us, with Abraham. We have this covenant. We are made his children. Now God wants a covenantal dialogue. He wants his children to speak to him. He wants to understand what's happening. He wants to see their perspective. He wants to teach us, guide us, correct us. He wants to show us his way, the way of righteousness, the way of justice. This is what he's doing with Father Abraham. This is what he wants to do with each of us, especially now in Christ Jesus in the new covenant. So it's the birth of the covenantal dialogue. Incidentally, we see this type of interaction, this type of appeal for the unrighteous, for the, um, for the sake of the righteous, a, a, a certain mercy for the unrighteous we see that here Lord are you going to destroy the entire city and, and what if there are ten righteous won't you spare the ten righteous I'll spare them by sparing the ten I, he actually spares the entire city so it's both an act of mercy to the righteous and then through the righteous to the unrighteous and we see this later in salvation history with Moses Moses has this same relationship with God that's expressly seen in Exodus chapter 5, verse 22. We see it during the rebellion in the desert when God's people rose up against him and he was going to inflict judgment upon the whole people. And there's an appeal, please spare the righteous. We see that in Numbers chapter 16, verse 22. We hear this theme constantly throughout the prophets that the righteous will in fact be the means of salvation for the unrighteous, and that God will spare the unrighteous for the sake of the righteous, and that he will hear the righteous and not inflict corporate punishment upon everyone. We especially see that in Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1, and Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 2 to 3. Of course, it's all throughout the prophets. Those are just two examples. Two examples. 
So with understanding, okay, this is the situation. Okay, there's, they're going back and forth and, and so on. But the, the question is still pressing. How can Abraham, how can a mere human being question the all-powerful God? Are we saying by this passage of Scripture that somehow Abraham's sense of justice is greater than God's? Because it appears as if God is equivocating, as if he's changing his mind, as if somehow Abraham is now taking the upper hand. What's going on here? What's happening? And it's interesting that the one who's challenging God is not a heretic, he's not a skeptic, he's not an atheist. The one who's challenging God is actually one of his servants, a hero of the spirit, a patriarch of his people. And it's Abraham who's the, who is the one doing the challenging and God is welcoming it, almost accommodating it. It appears as if he's adjusting according to it. Abraham who describes himself in the divine narrative, in the sacred narrative, he describes himself as mere dust and ashes. Abraham, mere dust and ashes, is confronting the judge of the world. This is the title given to God in this particular passage of the scripture. So Abraham says, I'm just dust, ash, and yet he's challenging the judge of the world, the judge of all the earth. And he's questioning and challenging God's verdict. God has come, God has verified the claims against Sodom. And he has now given a verdict. And Abraham is both questioning God, the judge of the earth, as well as his verdict in the case of Sodom and the cities of the plain. Let's look at that again, chapter 18, verses 17 to 19. The, the sacred narrative reads, The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I, what I am about to do? seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him. No, for I have chosen him, that he may, change, me, that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. So again, God is questioning, do I keep it from him? No, tell him, go and show it to him. And then here we see Abram, Abraham challenging this verdict of God as well as implicitly the justice of God. And again, how can this happen? How can mere dust and ash question the judge of all the earth? If we look at the particular context though, that was just read, God is having an interior monologue, again, an indication of the Trinity as God is speaking within himself and he's asking, do I tell Abraham? Sure, yeah. Let's, no, let's not keep it from him. Let's tell him what's going on so that he can learn and then can charge his house, can teach his children the way of righteousness, the way of the Lord. So it implies in this particular passage as if God is almost inviting Abraham. He's like, do we tell him? Yeah, we'll tell him. Why? Why would you tell him? Because Abraham's going to have to question so again, it appears as if a context is presented in which Abraham, an invitation is given, in which Abraham is going to speak, is going to challenge. And get this, if you look at that particular passage, again, verses 17 to 19, you'll see that God has even given Abraham the language. Listen to the words that God uses. He uses right and just. Look at that. There again, verses 17 to 19. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him? No, for I have chosen him, that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice. God within himself is even proposing language, right? Not only is he giving Abraham the opportunity, inviting Abraham to speak, he's giving the language. And so it shouldn't surprise us that when, when Abraham speaks to God, when he begins to intercede, he's actually using that language of righteousness and justice. These constitute righteousness and justice. These constitute the way of the Lord, the way that Abraham is to charge and to teach his children and his house in which they are to know and to follow God. God. 
So again, this powerful example, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of our time this evening, God is, in this introductory lead-in, is describing what's going to happen. Shall I tell Abraham? Yes, yes, I'm going to tell him what's happening. Why? Because he needs to know the path of righteousness and the path of justice. He needs to know the way of the Lord so he can charge and teach his children and pass it on and that the chosen people, God's people, will be a people of righteousness and justice. So the context is set, the stage is set for Abraham to pose the challenge, to ask the questions, to make the intercession. God wants Abraham to question him. God wants to see if Abraham has grown in his relationship with him. Will Abraham speak? Remember that the other righteous ones that we have spoken of, whether it's Adam and Eve or whether it was Noah, there was something lacking in them. They were worried about themselves, right? Even Noah, he was worried about just his family. No one no, never offered intercession for anyone other than his family. No one never asked God or questioned God or challenged God about the flooding of the earth because they didn't have that relationship with him. But here Abraham has a different, a unique, a radically new relationship with God that he can now not simply worry about himself and his family, but make intercession for even people he does not know. And he has the boldness in God, the relationship with God, the confidence in God that he can now speak. God wants Abraham to question him. Here's a sidebar, very important spiritual lesson. God wants us to question him. God wants us to question him. And, and, and a question is not a doubt. St. John Henry Newman, one of the most eminent theologians of the 19th century, said it very clearly. A thousand questions do not equal one doubt. Doubt is when we question, we reject God, we think that somehow this is not true, and so on. We have an obstinacy in our heart not to accept. That's a doubt. A question is very different. A question is an openness. We are tr truly seeking what is happening, what's going on, teach me. There's an openness of heart. As God wanted Abraham to question him in our spiritual lives, in our relationship with God, he wants us to question him. Lord, why is this happening? Lord, what's going on? Lord, when's the money going to come together? Lord, why am I dying? Lord, what? he wants us to question him. Abraham would never have had the relationship with God if he did not question him. If Noah, excuse me, if Abraham had had Noah's reaction, if Abraham had had Adam's reaction, he would never have had the relationship with God. God would never have been able to teach him to reveal himself to Abraham in a more powerful way than he did with Noah or with Adam. That puts things in perspective, doesn't it, Team Grace? Because what questions does God want us to ask him? Does he want you to ask him that you have not asked him either because of fake piety or because of a lack of confidence or negligence or distraction or whatever else might be happening in your life? What questions does God want to hear from you that you have not asked him for whatever reason? And that question, precisely that questioning in prayer, engaging God, might actually be the very means by which he gives you the answer, the consolation, the purpose, the meaning that you are looking for. The spiritual life is not easy. The spiritual life is not for wimps. The spiritual life is not some type of cotton candy. The spiritual life is the wrestling with God, the questioning of God, the seeking of God, the running after God. Do not pass by my tent. Come and stay with me. The spiritual life is providing the abundance of hospitality to God that he might stay with us. For we are not worthy. The spiritual life is asking the hard questions. What about 50? What about 45? What about 30? Look at Father Abraham, model for us the relationship we can have with the living God, especially now in Christ. God wanted Abraham to question him. But why? Well, I've given so many different answers, but let's look at what Jewish theology tells us. Jewish theology tells us that God wanted Abraham to question him in order for Abraham to know who he was. In order for Abraham to know who he was. 
in order for God to reveal to him, I am not like these false deities. I am not a God of wrath and destruction and injustice, injustice. I am not the God of licentiousness. I am not a petty God. God is revealing himself by the questioning to Abraham. There's going to be more. But listen to what Moses writes in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy is Moses' Moses's last will and testament. He writes it as he's dying. In fact, at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, he dies. Joshua, uh, his successor, has to actually finish the book of Deuteronomy. This is later in salvation history. In that part of salvation history, listen to what Moses, a man who's dying, had spent his entire life in the moment of his conversion there at the burning bush in a complete and total service to God. Gone through the 40 years of the desert, watching God purify his people, watching his generation die. And he's there and he's able to look into the promised land but not enter it because of his own disobedience. And listen to what he says. Moses speaking about God. He is rock. His works are perfect. And all his ways are just. A faithful God who does no wrong. Upright and just is the living God. Now, what Moses is describing later in salvation history could just as well be summarized by Abraham in this encounter he has with God here in Genesis chapter 18. Incidentally, the citation is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. And the words of Moses later in salvation history, again, we could take those same sentiment, those same convictions, and place them in the words of Abraham as he has this encounter with God because of what's happening. God is revealing to Abraham that he is going to rule by what is right and not by his might. He is going to come and exercise justice. It was precisely that understanding of God that God, the true God, rules by what is right and not by might. It was precisely this that distinguished Israel, distinguished God's chosen people from all the pagan tribes around them. Their God was not one who gloried in his power and his might in order to crush them and hurt them and treat them as if they were toys. That was not the true God. The true God said, I rule by justice and righteousness. And that distinguished Israel, distinguished God's chosen people, from the unbelievers, from the false deities, from the polytheism and the idolatry that surrounded them. And here, this lesson is being given to Father Abraham. I rule by what is right. I do not rule by, what, by my might. And that powerful lesson is being passed on to Abraham. As we see God's verdict being justified, Sodom denounced Genesis chapter 13, verse 13 and here's the, uh, the, the second citation, chapter 19, verses 4 to 5. We see in both contexts the wickedness of Sodom and the cities of the plain. And we see that God is seeking truth. He is not a petty God. He is not a capricious God. He is not a God of lies. He is not a God of darkness. He comes in order to seek the truth. And if we could ask in this exchange between Adam, between Abraham and God, maybe we need to change the whole context because here, if truth be, be spoken in the great, the great argument, it is not Abraham who is challenging God. Let's put it in proper context. In this passage of sacred scripture, it is God who is challenging humanity. It is God who is challenging humanity. I am a God of justice and mercy. What are you? I come in order to see a path of goodness and holiness. What path are you following? It is not so much that Abraham is, Abraham is challenging God, but again, that God is challenging humanity, challenging humanity through Father Abraham. God wants his people to be a people of righteousness and justice. He comes, he's modeling this behavior. He's come, he has told us already at the beginning of this part of chapter 18 that he wants Abraham to understand righteousness and justice. He comes, he is teaching Abraham and through Abraham his people because he wants the chosen people 
his people to always be a people of righteousness and truth, of righteousness and justice. And he's coming to Abraham and they're having this exchange back and forth. And in this very peculiar covenantal dialogue, God is molding and shaping Abraham. Because justice demands that both sides be heard. Justice demands that the other side of an argument or of an accusation be given. And here God is overlooking Sodom and Abram has followed him and he looks and he places Abraham in spite of Abraham's self. He puts Abraham in the role as the defense attorney. As Abraham himself is pleading the cause on behalf of Sodom. He himself is being molded and shaped in the spirit, a sense of justice. Would you really destroy the entire city if there were 50 righteous? What about 45? Even as he's saying the words, his heart is being molded and shaped into a sense of justice. God is teaching Abraham through the via negativa by taking the opposite, the most extreme, the opposite in terms of what is most undesirable he is proposing so that Abraham can then say, why would you do that? Would you not do that? It is not just. And as he says it, he himself is coming to believe it. As he says it, he himself, his heart is being formed to understand it. As he finds himself in the most peculiar positions as the defense attorney of Sodom, echoing the other side. And as God as both judge and prosecutors adjusting the penalty according to the advocacy of this just man, of Abraham. And Abraham argues the case of Sodom. And God adjusts a verdict that he was already anticipating to adjust. God was not changing his mind. God was proposing in order that his servant would adjust and his servant would be taught. Abraham would come to understand. Abraham, you are catching on. You are understanding. This is my mercy. This is my justice. You are beginning to understand it. For in the ancient world, if someone caused you harm, you killed them all. If someone caused difficulty or suffering or harm or, or, or caused a threat, you took him out. And Abraham was surrounded by these pagan cultures. They lived what they thought their false gods wanted. They lived according to what their false gods modeled. But here the one true God comes and he models justice and mercy as he molds and shapes the heart of Abraham. Abraham is led to an understanding of justice as he is also led to the understanding of righteousness. For he fulfilled justice's demands. He was a good defense attorney. <laughs> he got God from 50 to 10, right? Again, a concession God was planning before. But Abraham didn't know that and he was seeking justice. And even as he was making this bargain and, and the number was going down, he was beginning to realize this is justice, that you give people their due. Right? You give them a voice. You pay attention to what is proper and what is right. You listen to both sides. Even as he was learning, Abraham was learning justice. He was also learning, tragically, the way of the unbeliever. Because God would have spared Sodom in the cities of the plain for 10 righteous people. And we will see in chapter 19, they couldn't even find one. They couldn't even find one. And that's the second lesson to Abraham. The lesson of justice and the lesson of righteousness. God telling Abraham and Abraham's children you must not follow the way 
of the unbeliever. You must not follow their path of defilement, of vice, of evil, of idolatry. You must not follow that path that is not the way of the Lord. That is not my way. And God is forming and molding Abraham again in both justice and righteousness that he himself might know these, these might become a part of him and then he will charge and teach his family, his children and his children's children and this will be the mark of the chosen people, the people of God. They will be a people of justice as they will also be a people of righteousness and in a culture of idolatry and evilness and wickedness. That means... The path of righteousness means that we will not follow, we will not live according to the unbeliever. According to the person, the people, the culture, the society that does not know God. God's people are chosen. They are called out. They are different. They are to live differently. They are to fight what is unrighteous. They are to seek a path of righteousness. And their righteousness cannot become bloated to self-righteousness. Their righteousness is balanced constantly by a sense of justice. A justice that is even given to Sodom and the cities of the plain. It will be the justice that balances the righteousness as the righteousness tempers the justice. And this is the way of the Lord. This is the path that God is teaching Abraham. This is the story of chapter 18 of the book of Genesis. Especially this last part. Abraham's intercession for others. Team Grace, I want to thank you for joining me this evening for our Bible study. Tomorrow we're going to, excuse me, next week we're going to continue through the book of Genesis, uh, chapter 19. I've already referenced a little bit. It's going to be one of the darker parts of the scriptures. We're going to talk about what's happening, why it's happening. So I hope you can join me next Wednesday at 645 for our next Bible study. God bless you, Team Grace.